as I'm sure everybody knows, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of different ideas about God. I mean, that's why there are so many religions. And even within Christendom, there are dozens of different concepts or, or, or perspectives on, on, on about God. And that's, that's one of the reasons why there are so many different denominations and religious groups. One of the things that we hear from time to time is people will say, it's a distraction. The subject of God, strangely, I have to say strangely because it's the most amazing thing that somebody could say, discussing who God is, discussing the different aspects of truth relating to God. They'll say it's a distraction. It's not really important. People think things are important like... Um, well, the most important things they think are maybe like the judgment, maybe which day you worship, things like this. And they say the subject of God is not something we should really discuss too much. So, what I want to, to talk about in just the next few minutes is the question, is it really important? Is the subject of God really important? I became a Christian 40, 43 years ago. And one of the, 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 the things about my Christian experience, do I have to use this? Okay, it kinda, it's kind of constricting me a little. Anyway, I'll try, I'll try. Yeah, I'll try a little bit. All right, I just have to get used to it. And what I think has been a great blessing in my life is that I wasn't converted in a church. I was converted through some struggles I had. I was talking to God in my bedroom. I, in fact, I had not gone to church for five years up to that point. And at that point, I was, I was young, but I was a professing atheist. And... and when I realized that there was a God and that there was somebody that really, such a great being and that I could have a relationship with him, it blew my mind. For some reason, for some reason, that just overwhelmed me when I became a Christian. And I thought I can become his friend. It was all about the relationship. And I, I thank God that this is, this is the way it has been for the past 43 years. It has been about the relationship with a person. And this is why I understand that knowing, knowing, understanding the subject, the issues related to who God is, what kind of person he is, these are the most important questions in religion. If you, are, if you belong to a religion where God is not the central issue, you're in the wrong place. You know, what, what is your religion about? Anyway, I can go on and on rambling. So, I just want to start by looking at some verses here. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. I'll start with these verses. Verse 23 says, Thus said the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. This is um, God himself speaking through Jeremiah. And he, he's, he's, he's comparing the things that people find valuable, the things that people seek after, the things that people use as their credentials. I mean, sometimes it's amusing when you go to a, 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 a church and they're about to introduce the speaker, Okay. The, 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 the letters behind the name are almost as long as the sermon. And God says, the one who glories, the one who, who takes pleasure in anything, shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't glory in, in what he knows or in his wisdom. The greatest knowledge, the most valuable knowledge, he says, is the knowledge of God. Glory in that he understands and that he knows me. And this should set the tone for the way we um, approach religion. 
In, in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. I'm not, I'm not glorying in the fact that I don't have, I don't have a, a great deal of this world's education. I'm not glorying in it because I'm not trying to say that those who have it are in a worse position than I am. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad that my education went as far as college. I went to teacher's college, and that was the limit of my, my education. But I've spent 42 years immersed in the Bible. And it wasn't just the Bible. It was, it was the quest to know God. I've spent as much time meditating, looking at the stars, reading about how nature is designed. I've tried, and in everything, I've been trying to find out what kind of person is God? How can I get to know him? Sometimes, when you get certain kinds of information, it makes you want to shrink and draw back. Sometimes you think about the greatness of this person. Yeah. I mean, I started studying DNA when I was just about a couple of years ago. Just about two years ago. I started studying it on my own because I heard people saying that DNA was one of the most persuasive evidences for the existence of God. And when I began to understand how DNA works, man, I, I was past amazed that, that, that somebody could design something so intricate and beautiful and, and amazing, the whole pattern of creation. Sometimes your mind thinks, what kind of person is this? What kind of being is this? And then you want to shrink in a corner and you think, who am I? to dare to approach this person? Who am I to dare to call this person father? But the, the thing is, if you, look at, if you look at God through the eyes of science, or through the eyes of the power that exists in the universe, you want to draw back and find a corner and hide. But if you look at God in the light of what he has revealed, then you dare to draw near, and you dare to think, I'm accepted, I'm loved. I'm somebody. You know, I, I, I was speaking to um, somebody recently who is kind of like an a, a agnostic, a skeptic, and, you know, his idea is that God created the world. Maybe there's a God, and maybe he created the world, but he has been on vacation for, for thousands of years. He kind of just created us and abandoned us and left us. And it seems reasonable when you think of things from a scientific point of view because... In the, in the scheme of things, when you look at the universe and the stars and the, the galaxies, I am less than zero. I'm less than zero. Yes. In a universe, even, even, even in a planet with eight billion people like me, who am I? What is there to qualify me? I mean, when it comes to education, I'm mediocre. When it comes to physical attributes, I'm less than mediocre. When it comes to, what else, how else do you measure value? When it comes to intelligence and wisdom, I'm just about, there are thereabouts. What is there to qualify me? I don't know, but I learned something when I became a Christian. I learned that I am loved by the greatest entity that exists. I am loved. And that gave me such a sense of value. Nobody in this world is worth more than me because God loves me and he's on my side. Amen. That has been the thing. And, and it's true, the, the, the thing that every one of us needs to know, every one of us needs to know, is that he, the great God, this is how he feels about me, you, personally. It's like, it's like, it doesn't matter what you have been, where you have been, what you have done, what you have not done, what you have not achieved. When you become his friend, life just begins. Yes. There, is, there is no limit to the future because it's you and God Almighty. Hallelujah. And that's what God is trying to get across to us. Um, I was talking to my brother-in-law two nights ago. He's not a Christian. I went to see my, sis, my sister in New Jersey, and he was talking to me. And, you know, he was... He was talking about how many different religions there are and all the different ideas of God. And I give him an illustration. If an ant and a grasshopper 
set out to describe you, what would they come up with? I bet the, the ant would, would have a different description than the grasshopper. And I bet that both of them would be woefully inadequate when they came to describe you. And, and, and I still have not given a good illustration when I put it that way because me compared to God is far less than an ant. Yes. The capability of an ant to understand a human being. Okay? He might think these are monstrous entities. Okay? They pass through and they trample down your civilizations and your villages and they spray you and they're the, they are the worst kinds of beings in existence. And they say they have no heart and no mind. They mow us down by, by entire c- civilizations. Okay? And if cricket comes with his own, own perspective on it. In your mind, you're a kind person. You're a loving person. And you, you, one day, if you could, I mean, it's a poor illustration because we don't feel about these insects like God feels about us. For God, we are his children in the fullest possible sense. But, you know, the only way this ant or this cricket could really get an adequate idea or, or a reasonable idea of who you are is if you could somehow go down to their level and describe yourself. If you could somehow get down there and Reveal to them the kind of person you are. If you could do it in a believable way, then they might begin to understand human beings. But they could never by searching find out the kind of person you are. And this is why every religion has such a different concept of God. And I was trying to say to this brother, Christianity is the religion of all religions that says God has revealed himself to humanity. That is what makes Christianity superior. That's one of the things. In Christianity, we, we, we profess that God has made himself known by sending his son to this planet. Yes. And this is, this is how we can know God. Because if we try to find out God by searching nature or whatever other methods we use, we are going to come up with many different ideas. And most of them are going to be very limited and very wrong. That's why you have Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism and all the rest of it. Christianity says something a little different. So, God says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And no matter where we are in life and what we are doing, what kind of job we have, what kind of family we have, I want to encourage everybody to make this your great priority to know God. God is knowable not because you are capable of searching God out, but he is knowable because he is willing and wanting to make himself known to you. That's the greatest fact of human existence. When God is on my side, I don't have to have food. I don't have to have a job. I don't have to have a home. Because when I'm with him, he is God Almighty. When I'm in his hands, he can provide for me in ways that I can never imagine. That's the only place in this planet that we can be secure, in his hands. So, anyway, I'm rambling a little bit. In John 17 and verse 3, Jesus says, This is life eternal, that I might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So, Jesus says that this is what eternal life means. You know, interestingly, the Jehovah's Witnesses translate this verse, and this is what it means to have eternal life. It is to take in knowledge. So what they, have, what they have done, they have defined eternal life as being related to the information that you take in. Okay? But this is not what Jesus is saying at all. And this is not what the verses we have been reading means. Because knowing a person, if I say I know you, it means something different than if I say I know about you. I met Angel for the first time tonight. And... The others sitting there. I only knew Delran before, right? But they are my friends because we have been meeting on the conference on Sunday mornings. But I could say up to that point I know about them because I've seen their faces, I've heard their voices. At this point, point, we just got acquainted. I don't even know them fully yet, right? But when you know a person, it's more than just information. It's a beginning of an integration into the life and experience of that person. That's when you say, I know the person. I don't think anybody here knows Mr. Trump, right? But you know a lot about Donald Trump. Knowing about is a different thing. So, 
Knowing about God does not give eternal life at all, whatever anybody, whatever the Jehovah's Witnesses may say. Jesus says it is to know. And the word know, it carries the idea of intimacy. It's like, like the Bible says, Adam knew Eve and she brought forth a son. Okay? It doesn't mean that Adam began to study the theory of Eve. He, he, it was a lot more. When he knew his wife, it was an intimate interaction of one life with another life and the result was a child was born. So, so Jesus says this is eternal life that we may know God. Um, there is a in, in Psalm Psalm 115 verses 4 to 8 it says their idols are silver and gold the work of men's hands. They have mouths but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have, noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their, through their throat. Verse 8. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusted in them. There is a problem with having a false concept of God. What does it say? Those who make idols, what's the, what's the consequence? They become like them. There's a rule of life that by beholding we are changed. Worship is usually worship of God. The gods we, we believe in are usually the central issue in our lives. You become like the God you worship. When Christians four or five hundred years ago took fellow Christians and roasted them alive at the stake, why was that? It was a natural consequence of the kind of religion they believed in. They believed in a God who will burn people forever in hell. If my God will burn people in hell, can it be morally wrong for me to burn somebody for a few hours maybe? If God will do it for eternity, how can it be wrong for me to do it for a while? Especially if I believe this person is lost. Like I believe God is going to, to, to burn lost people forever. My concept of God definitely affects my own level of morality, how I believe. And that's the danger. That's the danger of having a false concept of God. We, when somebody says, it's a distraction. It's not important what you think about God. This person just doesn't understand. And I, I'll tell you, most likely, that person does not know God himself. It's like, it's like saying, I go back home to Jamaica, Okay. And there's a woman in my bedroom. It's my wife. Okay. <laughs> so, I enter into normal marriage relationships and after three days I realize it's not my wife. <laughs> she looks just like my wife. She behaves a lot like my wife. But then I discover that it's not my wife. Somebody says, it doesn't matter. Why do you think of that person? Crazy. Crap. When somebody said it doesn't matter, they're out of their mind. Okay? And it's kind of like the way it is with God. If you, if, if you think knowing God and having a relationship with Him doesn't matter, then it's because your religion is not real and your relationship with God is not a real relationship. It's a theoretical thing that you get involved in from a distance because you think it's a necessity. But you don't know the person. When it comes to real relationships, knowing the person and having to deal with the person himself or herself is very important. You can't have something real. You can't have a real relationship if you really don't know much about the person you are dealing with. So, the psalmist says, God says through the psalmist that the problem with False ideas about God is that the worshiper becomes like the God that he worships. And that is, that is prob probably the greatest reason why we need to study the subject of God and make sure that we have the right concept of God. It is how it affects us. It's not just that God says, I want to be worshipped. I need to be worshipped. I demand to be worshipped. I, I, I thrive on praise. And if you don't, if you don't worship me, you are somehow belittling and demeaning me. It's not about God because you can't put anything on God and you can't take anything off God Almighty. Your simple little 
you're, 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 a, you're a zero in the universe. Your little words can neither make God better or make God less. But it's about you. It's what you are doing to yourself. It's because, it's because of his love for you why he requires you, wants you to understand because by beholding, by beholding the God that we worship, we become changed into the same image. Now, it's true that even in the Bible, there are different revelations of God. I will admit this, okay? If you, if you come to the Bible as a, as a novice, and you approach it the way many people do, okay? God said, God said, Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and smite you and your 50. Fire comes down from heaven and destroys 50 men. Uzza touches the ark and he drops dead on the instant. Achan takes a goodly Babylonish garment and God says, stone him till he's dead. Korah, Dayton, and Abiram rebel against God and the earth opens and swallows them up. That's one picture of God. And if you take this picture of God and you don't understand what is happening, you can become a very scared worshiper. Okay, many people worship God because they don't want to end up in hell. It has nothing to do with appreciating God or loving God. It's more a defense mechanism where I have to do this. If I don't, I'm lost. It's not because they have any kind of love and affection for God because their concept of God has been colored by looking at one picture and not getting a balanced view of all the scripture. We don't have the time to really go into the, the question of why are there these differing revelations of God in the Bible? Not this evening. But there are these differing revelations. But I just want to say something. One thing. God makes a statement. And this is my bottom line. God says, through Jesus. Jesus says, or the Bible says. John says it. Paul says it. He says, no man has seen God at any time. John 1 and verse 18. In fact, we could look at it. John 1 and verse 18. It says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. What's the point? The point is, none of you, except Dario and Howard, has ever seen my grandson or, or has ever seen my wife and Deliran <laughs> and Isaiah, right? But at the same time, Deliran comes back and begins to tell you what my wife is like. He can give you a good description of her features, her height, and so forth. But he's going to, be, to necessarily give you a limited description and perhaps a, a distorted description because he was there for one day and only saw her in a certain setting. He saw her in a church setting. He doesn't know what she's like when she's upset, when I do something that ticks her off. He doesn't know. He doesn't have an idea of what she's really like, okay? He, he, he's kind of giving you a, a third-hand description. Now... It says, nobody has ever seen God. Moses didn't see God. Well, the Bible says he saw his back part. When you see a person's back, what does that imply? I think that was deliberately done by God. God could have appeared. Abraham saw, saw the face of, of, of God when God came and talked with him, but he appeared as a man. The reason why God deliberately showed Moses his back part, it was a, an object lesson to say, all that I can make known through Moses is what is represented by the back part. Moses, Elijah, Samuel, they all gave us third-hand revelation of God, what they heard. But the Bible says, the only begotten Son is where? In the bosom of the Father. If you want to know the truth about my wife, expect to hear it from somebody who has been in the bosom. In other words, my relationship with her is of the most intimate sort. I've been around her for nearly 40 years now. If I tell you about how she is, you have good reason to believe my testimony. 
And that's what the Bible is saying about Jesus. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. Okay? When I began to understand Jesus, I felt comfortable to call God Daddy. I felt comfortable to lie down and look up at him and just talk to him. I felt comfortable to know that I had done something wrong and come to him and just say, and, and just be free with him. I didn't have those inhibitions anymore of fearing, man, maybe I have to go and make things right before I can dare approach him. I knew when I looked at Jesus and I understood, I knew he was my father and that I could never do anything to make him change that attitude towards me. That's, that's probably the greatest thing that I ever learned in my life, how much God truly loves me. Jesus is the final revelation of God, and I love that. Look at this statement in Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 1. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the world. It's a strange passage if you don't understand what it's saying. It seems to be saying, it says, in the past God spoke to prophets. And so people say, God doesn't use prophets anymore. That's not what he's saying. The New Testament has many prophets. But what he's saying is that, why and how did God speak to prophets? He was trying to do the thing that he wants to do most of all. And what is that? To make himself known. All the prophets, the whole Bible was God's effort to make himself known. And he had to work in a, in a limited way at first because there were certain, 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 the situation made it necessary for God to work in a certain way. But he was trying to make himself known. It says, in, in, in past times he spoke by prophets, but in these last days, now he has spoken by his son. And I like to say, finally, conclusively, comprehensively, decisively, Absolutely, God has finally made, God has made this final statement about himself. If you don't accept what he says about God, where else are you going to look? When I see God, when I see Jesus coming to a woman taken in adultery on the Sabbath, okay? I mean, according to the law, according to the Old Testament, according to the, the religious leaders, that woman should at least have been disfellowshipped. At the very least, but they wanted to stone her, right? What does Jesus say? I don't condemn you. How can you not condemn the woman? She was caught on the Sabbath in the middle of the act. I don't condemn you. Because God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. And that is an expression of how God always felt about me and you. He never ever wanted to condemn us. His, all his effort was to help us and to make us know the truth about himself. I don't, I mean, people will say some of our ideas are presumptuous. They say we teach cheap grace, okay? They say, they say we are trying to eliminate accountability because we are focusing on God's love and we are not hitting hard enough at the dangers of wrongdoing. But you see, the world has been unbalanced long enough on one side. Yes. People have been afraid of God and they have, they have been more concerned about God's willingness to smite than upon the truth of the matter. You know, my grandson is five and a half years old and I, I always talk about my grandson because I'm learning so much just by being around that little boy because I, my children grew up, but they grew up, I didn't know what I know now. I was learning the lessons as well. But... My grandson, he, 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 he's a beautiful little boy, but he has, a, he has a fault that shows up. Like if he's embarrassed, he gets into a temper. So we were playing sword fight. I was playing sword fights with him, right? And he, he said, hold on, Grandpa, wait. And he was fixing his sword, and I stuck him in his side. And everybody started to laugh. <laughs> and he got into a temper, and he ran into the room, and he was in there raging and his mother went in and she said kid kid calm down grandpa was only playing with you calm down and he said i'm trying i'm trying but it's so hard <laughs> oh my goodness my heart just broke look here the little boy is trying 
He's born. You, 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 you know, you adults, when you, get, when you get upset, when somebody does something, and you get upset and you're trying to think, I need to love this person, I need to forgive. And your heart is saying, but so and so. He's a little boy, five and a half, and he says, I'm trying, but it's hard. How do I feel? Why would I say, you better not behave like that again, or I'm not playing with you anymore? Why would I say that? I would have to have a heart of stone, right? I mean, I took him and put him in my lap, and I went and started showing him some video. In a, in a moment, everything was, was okay again, all right? And, um, but but it, it just moved me, and it touched me when, when I heard him say, I'm trying, but it's so hard. And I realized... Is it any different with us when we, when we make mistakes, when we fall? Even, even, even if we know and we deliberately do wrong, can God hear us saying, I'm trying, but it's hard. Does he hear? Yes. And people don't think of God like that because he's a great, almighty creator of science and the universe. These two pictures in our minds sometimes are in conflict. And that is why when he sent his son, God didn't send a scientist, I, I suppose. Okay? Yes. And he didn't send, he sent a computer, okay? He sent a person in, in living color, flesh and blood, down at our level, walking on, on, on the level of the poorest of us. He sent his son because that's what we can understand and that's what we can feel. And he says, look at my son. And when you have seen and you have understood, come to me on that basis, okay? If you see my son taking babies in his arms and blessing them, that is my heart. Yes. If you see my son calling Zacchaeus out of the tree, okay, a man so ashamed of his sinful behavior, he doesn't even want to look at his face. And, I, and he seeks him out and calls him out of the tree. If you look at him washing the feet of dirty fishermen, if you look at John lying in the bosom of Jesus, you are looking at the heart of God Almighty. The creator of the universe has a heart. And sometimes when you stop to think about it, it makes sense because where did my heart come from? Where did my feelings come from? Where do these emotions come from that burn so deep inside? Where did they come from? Somebody created me like this. Did he just create me when he's so very different he cannot even feel what I feel? Reason and my own existence, tell, existence tells me that God has to be, that I have to be a reflection of his great heart. So you know what? When I'm dealing with God, I ignore God Almighty. And I come down to my daddy. Because that's what I can relate to. Okay. Um, now, God understands our need for this revelation of God. God understands our need to understand him. There are three aspects of God that I think are very important, and these are the things that we want to be sharing, focusing on this weekend. Just in a small way, because it's not long enough to really delve deeply into, the, in, into this, but we are going to be talking about God. And there are three aspects of God's uh, being, I would say, that we need to look at. The first of all is the nature of God. And, and what is he? What is God? And, I'm, and, and we will see why this is important. Okay? The nature of God. Um, and the reason why we need to understand that is because, you know, there are many, there are many religious people who, they're what you call pantheists. They think God is a part of nature. In fact, one young lady I spoke the night before last, that's what she said. She says she, she believes in God, but she believes that God is like all nature makes up God. So, it's important to understand God's nature, because if God is not, if God is, is, is an essence that pervades all nature, then what we are saying tonight about God being my father and God having feelings and God able to be touched by my feelings is just a myth. All right, so, so to, to relate to God in the way that he is, we need to understand his nature. That's the that's first thing. 
Another important reason is that it affects this question. Is God able to be in all places at all times? Because there are some people and there are some Christians of my acquaintance who believe that God is limited to a throne in heaven. They believe that God is limited to that seat and that God is only present here because he has angel representatives. So the angels represent God and in this sense he's, he's omnipresent. So those questions are important because is God really with me and in me or am I dealing with a representative? Because it's going to be different if I'm dealing with a representative. Okay? I don't pray to a representative. And I, 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 it changes it. It changes it. It changes it if, if, if I came here and Delon said, I'm sorry I couldn't come from New York. I'm going to send a representative. He sends a friend of, friend of his. My relationship with that person is going to be different than with Delron. I mean, just dealing with things on a practical level. Just simple little illustration like that. It's different when you are dealing with, a, with a, a, a representative. So, anyway, it's important to understand his nature. Secondly, is his identity. Who is he? And um, that's important because it involves who we worship and how we worship. But it also involves the plan of salvation. And I'm going to, we're going to be looking at that. If you misidentify God, if you misidentify God, I don't know if there's such a word. I'm, I'm coining it if it doesn't exist. If you misidentify God, I will show you clearly that you cannot understand the plan of salvation. And if you don't understand the plan of salvation, you cannot believe in the plan of salvation. And if you don't believe in the plan of salvation, you cannot receive what you should receive. That's the bottom line. If you don't believe, you can't receive. And you can't believe if you don't understand or you don't know. So it's important to understand God's identity. And thirdly, the aspect of it that, that I love most of all, God's character. Ultimately, I, I think that's probably the most important of all. So we have the nature of God, the identity of God, and the character of God. And I think character is most important because if God looks like a tree and he has that heart towards me, that heart that I see in Jesus Christ, it's still the most important thing. But all three of them put together gives us an amazing picture of who God is and of what he's trying to accomplish on this planet. So the revelation of God is everything. And there are three places in the Bible I'm going to end or hand over to Brother Howard after looking at these three verses. Numbers 14 and verse 23 is the first place it, ap it appears. God says it three times in the Old Testament. But as truly, verse 21, Numbers 14 and verse 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. The first time you hear something like this, you say, why is God so egotistical? Everybody must worship him. His glory must be everywhere. My glory will I not give to another or my praise to graven images. He's so full of himself. It seems that way. Okay. Now, the context of this statement is Aaron and Miriam were criticizing Moses. And God smote Miriam with leprosy. And, and Moses went to pray for Aaron and Miriam. And God says, I have, I have pardoned. According to your word. You have prayed for them. I have pardoned them. But as I live. God takes an oath. And he swears by himself. By his existence. As I live. The earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. This seems to be something very important to God. He takes this tremendous oath. Isaiah 11 and verse, 20, um, verse 9 says it. Again. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Hallelujah. Habakkuk 2 and verse 14 says it again. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It seems to be something important to God. And if you think of God as being, if you don't understand God, you think he's just a self-centered being. But the thing is, what I've discovered and what every one of us who is, a, who, who is a Christian, every one of us who knows God, what we have discovered 
is that there is no true happiness in life without God. People use that as a cliche. I'm going to tell you something. When I was a professing atheist between 17 and 22, something used to happen to me. And I only ever heard one other person say it happened. But I guess it happened to, to many people. There are days when I would listen to some music or, or, or I would go outside and it would be a bright sunny day or, or I would see children playing and something would move inside here. I didn't know what I wanted. It's like, it's like something just turned over inside of me and I didn't know what I wanted. The day when I was converted, for three days I was in torment because I got myself in some tremendous trouble and I couldn't tell anybody. I couldn't tell my brothers or my parents. It was such a, a terrible thing. And I thought, I, I even thought of killing myself. And after three days, the thought came to my mind, you never gave God a chance. Just like that, I who, who said I didn't believe in God, the thought just came, you never gave God a chance. And I, I was so fed up of my existence because it's like I just wasted my life. I was just 22, but it seemed to me at 22 that everything I, I was, my life was just going nowhere. And I thought, what if there is a God? What if there is somebody who will take my life and just, just straighten it up and do anything he wants? What if he will take it and just... And, and after a while, it wasn't about the problem anymore. It was about the possibility of an exciting tomorrow. What if there was such a person who could take my life and just change direction and, and just, just, just make everything perfect? Just do it his way. And so the third day, I prayed. I don't know if I knelt or I stood up. I went into my room and I prayed. And when I, when I prayed, the world was sitting on my head. And when I got up, I was as light as a feather. I remember I looked out the window. And it's a strange thing because I've heard several people say this since. I looked out the window. And I had never seen the grass so green in my life. And I looked at the sky. I had never seen it so blue in my life. It's like I'd stepped into a, a recreated world. And from that moment, I've been a Christian until today. From that moment, my life changed. I never felt that aching feeling anymore. I never felt it again in my life. It's like, it's like the, the empty spot inside of me was filled. Hallelujah. Now, God knows that nothing else can ever satisfy us but himself. He knows. Many people join a church. They adopt a religion. They take up religious practices, but they have not met God. And so they don't know what I'm talking about. But when you meet God and you enter into an experience with him and he becomes the source and the reason of your life, you have found your place. You have found the reason for your existence and something changes forever. You know true satisfaction. And that is why God says, The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It is for our sakes. It's going to be a world filled with happy people because everybody will know God. And that is why he says, This is my dream. This is God's dream. Okay, this is God's dream. And that is what he had been working for from the beginning. Okay, man turned against God in the beginning, became scared to death of God, didn't trust God. From the, 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 the entire Bible is God's attempt to help us to know the truth about himself, that we may, we may find our place again in the heart of God. So, that is what... I want us to consider and hope to be, be expanding on a little bit in these meetings over this weekend. So, I'm going to pause and just hand over to Brother Howard. I don't want us to be too late this evening, but I want to say I appreciate all those of us who have come. I didn't expect so many people to be here, but I appreciate you coming, and I hope you'll come back again tomorrow evening. And also on Sabbath, we're going to be somewhere else. I hope you're going to be there. And I hope to get to know you all better as time goes on. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Brother Howard. <laughs>